determine are those going to be uh, work in the market or not, and then is the company secure and safe? Are they able to, when they develop code, actually able to do it quickly, or does it take a long time? So that's what I get to do typically two times a month, sometimes three times a month. I get to look at those companies and write up a report for investors. Okay? Another thing that I do is I help older software companies. Uh, just in December, I helped a company here in Austin, and they've been in business for about six years, and they make software to help dealerships, car dealerships, rent cars to their... Um, to anybody that wants to rent cars. Have any of you ever seen a car dealership rent cars? Anyone? Yeah. So that's a fairly new concept though, and so they're trying to determine how to build that. But this team that I was working with was struggling and they were having a lot of trouble just coming up with new ideas. So we'll spend about three days with the team in their office. We look at their drawings of their architecture. When I mean by architecture, this is their software systems. How well do they work? And we help them overcome some of these challenges, and then we have about a week or two to write a report of recommendations, okay? So this is a company that may be struggling that needs help in order to grow their computer systems and really con to con grow their market. The third thing I do is that I'm an interim, meaning I'm a temporary leader of a company. So right now, I'm helping an electric bicycle company with their computer systems, okay? This company is about 15 years old, and they're one of the leaders in electric bikes. So the founder, he is only 32 years old, and he invented his electric bike. He lived in California, and he just strapped an electric motor to a regular bicycle, and it started taking off. What do you think his first computer system that he really needed to do uh, for his company? Any guesses? What? Buying the bikes, yeah. He needed an e-commerce site, right? So he, well, you mean buy them to, to, in order to, to, to sell them or to buy the parts for them? To sell them to the public, yeah. Yeah, so he needed what was called an e-commerce site, okay? How many of you, have any of you built your own e-commerce site yet? Have any of you played with one at all? Okay, tell me, what did you, what did you like about the site? Did you make it from scratch or did you use a template or a tool? A template, yeah. Uh, was it a WordPress site? Shopify, there you go. Well, that's, this company started on Shopify and they're still on Shopify today. How, was it easy to, to get going on Shopify? Yeah. So they're actually outgrowing Shopify, which is a good sign. That means they're making a lot of money. And it's very difficult for them to um, modify their Shopify site. So when they first built this, uh, their website, you know, they had all these really cool videos of, you know, guys that are probably your age, maybe 20 years old, jumping their bikes. And when they found out who was buying the bikes, who do you think buys these electric bicycles that are $1,500 to $2,000? Not, Not kids, exactly. <laughs> My age, right? 50 and older. So they, had to, they wasted all that money on all that video and all that cool marketing, so they had to rapidly change and redo their whole website. So those are the kind of the fun things. So now their Shopify site has gotten so big, for those of you that know Shopify, they have to put, it's called split that site apart. And so how do you keep that website running all day long? You can't take it down, but start taking apart pieces of it and say what runs in Shopify runs in different systems. We call those strangling off patterns. And so you have, but you have to keep the business up and running. So that's the kind of stuff we're working on with that company. And they also have, uh, they need a lot of systems now. They are up to about 30 or 40 different systems. Some just to manage the manufacturing of the bike. Four or five years ago, all of their parts were made in China. And as you can imagine now, that's been very risky having everything made in just one country. They've had to diversify and get manufacturing in other countries in Southeast Asia. With COVID, it's been very difficult for them because they put all these bikes on the ships, right? And once it leaves, once it's on the ship, they have no visibility where it is across the ocean. So people have ordered that bike and they don't know when's their bike gonna show up. So they really struggled last year just letting their customers know where's their bike, is it on its way or not. Now the company has grown. They sell not only online, but they have stores in some markets. They also have vans that will drive and bring you a bike to test ride. 
seems expensive, but anytime someone rides a bike, they uh, are much more willing to spend that $1,500 once they've rode the bike because it's in a very different feeling on that electric bike. So rapidly growing company, they're doing well, and uh, so it's pretty exciting stuff. So I get to do all three of those things at the same time, and uh, the fourth thing that I do is I teach classes. So some of the, our, our clients will come in and we'll teach them two or three days these important concepts, how to make sure your computer systems scale. So for example, I looked at a company a year ago uh, you guys use it all the time, Pear Deck. You guys all use Pear Deck? So I only had about seven or eight hours to look at that software to make sure that it was scalable. Has your Pear, have you guys had any issues with Pear Deck going down? Have you guys had any issues with other systems going down? Schoology? Yeah. Those are the kinds of things that we do to help those systems go down. So they're not one of our clients yet, but those are the, those are the challenges that you would have if you go into those kind of companies is to make sure not only does it work well, but it has to always be up and running, and that's a lot of engineering. So how did I get to this point? Well, I graduated uh, from UT with a degree in mechanical engineering in 1993. Okay, So mechanical engineering, you may wonder, how did you get into computers? Back then in 93, that was before the internet, when we had to write book reports, we had to go into a library and you had to look up a book in something called a card catalog uh-huh and what was it was called the dewey decimal dewey system, system. uh-huh and you were hoping to find that one or two books that on your topic and this is why you had to not have you had to have different people research different topics because everybody would go find that one book and how did you find something in the book I had to read it or look at the end. Yeah, you had to get very good. I mean, just it's so hard to imagine how limited our research was back 30 years ago. Yeah. And um, so when I graduated college, uh, it was in mechanical engineering. I had to decide, do I want to go into oil and gas, which was very common here, or there was a company called Anderson Consulting at the time. It's now called Accenture. They were recruiting anyone that could think like an engineer and they would tell you, they would train you in the computer system. So I only took one programming class in college. I didn't have a lot of the courses that even you guys are taking now. How many of you are taking a computer science uh, or some networking classes? Okay. Yeah, I did not take that in undergrad, in high school. Um, I only learned those concepts on the job later. So you're very fortunate to learn these things now. Uh, so I, I really encourage you to do that. So it was just a random, by cho I shouldn't say random, it was, very, it was just a small decision at the time to not go into me something mechanical and actually go into software. And I was fortunate because two years later, I can remember where I was in an office the first time I saw a web browser, which to you guys may seem like nothing. But if you can imagine when you had to look for books and you had to go read the whole book and then you saw the very first web browser, you realize the world is very different right then. And so that's how I decided to stay in computers. Uh, I was in consulting for about five years and then I applied to business school and I applied to eight different business schools. All the top ones in the country, Harvard, Stanford, uh, Michigan, Wharton, UCLA. I got rejection letter, rejection letter, rejection letter, rejection letter. I got seven rejection letters and I was crushed and I thought, boy, what am I gonna do now? At that time, I was going to, uh, I made the decision I was going to go to South America to try to learn Spanish. And I was just calling my friend uh, who lived in Argentina to tell him I was going to head that way. And then I got a phone call from my girlfriend at the time that said, you got into Wharton, a business school. And so I had to completely change my mindset. And I was at business school for two years. So um, that was a very fortunate time. And during that period, there was what was called a dot-com bubble where a lot of companies went uh, very high valuations, were kind of in a bubble, uh, potentially right now, but uh, th that's when I graduated. And then after that, I had saved up money for about four years. I'd been on complete savings on my very own, and then uh, went, moved to California and joined some friends at eBay. And eBay, this was after it already become fairly good size, and I was at eBay for about 10 years, and I've been in computers since then, so. 
So that's where I am today. Uh, we are at about 10 minutes here. I just want to hit some of the, the key skills that I learned along the way. The engineering degree was really critical, uh, even though I didn't use it immediately. It's the way that you think, the way that you learn how very complex systems interact. So we had to learn in mechanical engineering, how do you have a combination of an electrical system working with a mechanical system with also with heat transfer. And so you learn a very good cross section of skills that ultimately I think will help you um, if you're ever gonna go into any kind of field of engineering. And it really had made me very comfortable just digging into computers because I could visualize how various different systems worked. In consulting, one of the skills that you learn is how to go from being an individual contributor, meaning you work on something by yourself, and then within two or three years, how do you learn to lead and manage others and delegate and make sure they know what they're doing, okay? So you learn how to manage others. That's a critical skill that you wanna think about as you, after you graduate from college, is management. And so how many of you have part-time jobs right now? Okay. I would encourage all of you to get a summer job if you can, um, and even now at this age. It's one of the more critical skills because one of the things that you're always going to need is the ability to sell. When I say sell, is persuade and speak to others. And if you can do that at this age, because most likely in college you may not, it's harder to get a summer job in college that where you get those skills. You're probably going to be very focused on your, your career path. But any job you get right now where you get to interact with adults that are frustrated, it's a very good, a very good experience to have right now. And I can tell you, a hiring manager can tell by interviewing you if you've had that experience because you're going to be able to handle the situation. I know you guys are in a great school system here. You do a lot of teamwork, and so you won't have a lot of the dysfunction that I've seen uh, hiring from some other schools because most kids here are very well prepared. And then I'll, I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, but I'll echo what Monica, Monica yeah, what Monica said. When you go to undergrad, you know, don't assume you're going to get all A's. I had straight A's in high school. I had to very quickly adjust to getting all B's in uh, undergrad, and then very quickly in grad school to even be getting comfortable with just C's in grad school. So don't beat yourself up. Just make sure that you understand the concepts and pass, and um, you know, don't don't get too discouraged by that. So we have about nine minutes left. Any questions about what, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so how many of you, uh, do you know the difference between venture capital and private equity? You do, okay, some of you may not know that. Venture capital is typically the very early round of investing. And so in the very early round of investing, you're, you're not necessarily looking at, you don't do as much due diligence as what I just described. You're actually investing in the people. Do you trust that person? Has that person have a winning record? Can, do you think they can sell and lead others? And so typically we're after what's called venture capital. Venture capital really doesn't even get time to do that due diligence. They get a phone call to say, hey, you've got a few hours to invest like $2 million. And so there's not enough time to do that. That's all built on trust. So I work with something called private equity, which is a little bit different where they're typically, it's a larger amount of money. So the venture capital typically works at about 5 million to 10 million. Private equity is the next tier up though, okay? But yes, they do get to work with the earlier round venture capitalists though. Any other questions? Yes. Both. So like for architecture, we look at several things. So for example, one of the things we look at is everything in the system, is it redundant? Meaning you have web servers, you have maybe load balancers, you have routers, you have application servers, database servers. You would like at least two of all those things, okay? And so that means there's redundancy at every single component. If one fails, the other one can pick it up. Okay. So we look at redundancy, and then we also look at, is that thing backed up somewhere else? So right now, it's, are you able to, do you use Amazon Web Services or anything like that? 
It's very easy now for you just to basically rent a web server if you want though, and you can spin those up. So we also want to make sure if one thing breaks, is it backed up somewhere else? Okay. And what happens is uh, Amazon, they have a lot of different what are called data centers, and they have data centers around the country. Well, even they have their entire data centers have gone down, and every customer in that data center is down, which means thousands of companies were down a few months ago for several hours because they were all in one data center, which means the companies that use those systems have to back them up into another one, though. Okay. So another thing that we do for implementation is how well do they split apart their architecture, meaning how many of you just write your own code? You do? Okay. Have any of you ever had to share code with someone else? Okay. How many people are sharing that same bit of code? Well, let's say when you have a very large piece of code, you might have 10 people all checking the code in and out. When companies get very big, they don't think about this. When you get to 100 people, it's very inefficient because you're going to check in and you're going to have conflict. So the organization actually is slower at delivering new features if their code base is too big. So you want to split those apart. It also helps you split it apart that different parts of the system will work and not. So for Shopify, for example, the page may still come up, but search may not work. Or the products may come up on a Shopify site, but you may not see the prices. Or you might be able to load your cart, but you may not be able to check out. That's called splitting apart your services. And then you can further do splits where, let's say you want to have the architecture split between the East Coast and the West Coast. So people that are coming from, say, New Jersey hit, hit servers in New Jersey, and people in California hit some there. So if New Jersey goes down, the rest of the country's not down. So that's a combination of architecture and implementation, okay? Yes? So we work with anybody that has uh, software as their primary business. They sell software, okay? And that could be an e-commerce company. That could be software for businesses. So all the software that you guys use today to go to school, that would be a potential customer of ours. All the software that you see, any business you go into, those are potential customers of ours. And that software can be used for individuals. We call that business to consumer or they could be used by businesses. That's called business to business type software. Those are my primary types of customers. Uh, I would say the bike company is a little bit out of my, uh, that's not our typical kind of customer, but they're becoming more and more so because that bike company I mentioned, they are going to eventually have what's called a smart bike, okay? The bike today isn't smart. What do you think means a smart bike means? Potentially, they're not going to uh, say it that way initially. It'll be smart in the way that it can sense things from the environment. So where is the bike? Kind of like Life360. Uh, how many of you have your parents know where all you are at all times? Most of you? Yeah. So that's not on the bike yet. That's going to be more embedded into the bike, though. So that's where it would become more of uh, where we would help, though. So any of those companies. But, but our industry... A lot of our um, business comes from referrals. So meaning somebody knows us, they refer to us. But we still need to have a decent website presence ourselves. We need to write content so that people can find us. So it's important, even though I do consulting, I also need to write blog posts and explain what we do. Any other questions? Yes? Favorite one? Oh boy, that's a tough one. That's like picking your favorite children, uh, favorite kid. Some days it's clear. Um, no, let's see. My favorite one that I've worked with, uh, gosh, I would say just the the bike company right now, uh, because it's there. There were others that were fun. Actually, no, I will say the one last week was a lot of fun. Uh, one that I did last week was they are out of England and they have software for very large companies that have hourly workers. So think of McDonald's and think of Wendy's or anyone where you're an hourly worker. And most of you are probably, your jobs are hourly, meaning you get paid by the hour. The way that most of those big companies work is you will get a paycheck every two weeks, okay? And it's very hard for people that are hourly to kind of manage that money coming in. 
what they don't see is uh, how much did they make that day, okay? What this company does, it takes those existing systems and it helps those employees see how much money they made that day and can help them set aside savings and see their budget for that week. And so that's pretty exciting because when you're hourly, those jobs are um, hard to keep and sometimes hard, and it's hard for the employers to keep good talent too. And so it helps them. So that was a, a really rewarding one for that company. Yes? So are you sort of like a very large company? No, it's very small. We're only, uh, we're under 20 people. Yeah, very small. Right before COVID, I was expected to travel 40 weeks a year. Uh, every week I would be gone, and, uh, but I joined the company the week before COVID shut things down. And I've only been on the road twice since then. So fortunately, I'm just starting to travel a bit right now though. Any other questions? Yes. The size of my company? Yeah. Well, uh, it's interesting you ask that. One of uh, the things that our founder believes in is small, durable, autonomous teams. So he actually, after he retired, he went and got his PhD in research. And one of the questions was, why did, and he was ex-Army, and you guys are probably too young to know this, but in the first uh, wave in Iraq, a small group of special forces was able to wipe out the Taliban in just a few months. And then later we brought in larger waves of, the, of our entire military, and some would argue, good or bad, we've, we're, we're no longer there, and you could say we, we lost. Why did the small teams do so well? Why did the large entity not do so well? Covert, yeah. Also, there were, there were several things. There were unique roles. There were like medics. They were very distinct, and there were two of everything. So basically the teams were small and autonomous, and meaning they weren't more than 12 people. And there's some theory around that about how many people can you have close friends and connections with, and how many people can you coordinate with. So that's a big part of it too. And so you're, the idea is you want these small autonomous teams versus when you get into some of these larger companies, you actually get, it's too hard to coordinate with everyone and it becomes more what we call bureaucratic, okay? So generally that's one thing that we advise our companies is even as you get big, make sure your teams are small, durable, and autonomous, that they're not dependent on other teams to do their job. It's much more rewarding, typically, and we find that team members feel more ownership as a team and not necessarily as a boss versus a bunch of subordinates. So good question about that. That's, that's one of the reasons uh, that why our team is small right now. It's a very unique skill set. Okay. All right. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Peter.